We are nearing the end of Jesus' life. He's been on the cross for six hours. It's become harder for him to breathe. He's exhausted. His mouth is parched. We hear him say, I thirst. And a Roman soldier offers him sour wine vinegar. And this wasn't the first time that Jesus was offered wine during this whole horrid ordeal. Right before he was lifted up, Jesus was offered a goblet of wine. As was customary to offer a condemned person wine in order to somewhat numb the pain. Jewish women of nobility actually donated the wine, believing it to be an act of piety. They considered it a small act of mercy for someone dying an agonizingly slow and painful death. But Jesus refused that first cup of wine And his reasons for doing so, we're not really sure. But we might wonder if he wanted his disciples to see with their eyes what he had said to them at the Last Supper. When he took the cup and offered it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Now, of course, those disciples couldn't fully have understood what Jesus was trying to tell them. But most likely, they envisioned what the prophet Isaiah had described as the heavenly banquet a feast of aged wine and the best of meat to be prepared by the Messiah for all the dearly departed faithful. A banquet at which martyrs, those who died for their faith, had taken a special place of honor. Because what those disciples didn't realize in that moment is that when Jesus took this wine from the Roman soldier and said with his dying breath, I thirst, he, that promise he made to them at the Last Supper was fulfilled. He was entering his Father's kingdom, and through the outpouring of his blood, for the forgiveness of all our sin, his Father's kingdom could now become a reality here on earth. And again, who is it that offered Jesus that sour wine? A Roman soldier. Quite possibly one of the soldiers who only a few hours earlier had beaten Jesus, stripped him, mocked and spit on him stuck a thorn of crowds, crown on his head, piercing his scalp so that blood ran down his face. Ghastly wounds that this soldier was now forced to see up close and personal. As he too hears these final words of this condemned criminal. I used to believe this was one final act of humiliation to offer a thirsty, dying man sour vinegar. But Luke makes it clear that what the soldier gave Jesus was a drink called Pascha, old wine diluted with water that was not only cheap for a soldier to buy, but it actually quenched his thirst better than water alone. It was a Roman soldier's drink of choice while they had to stand in the hot sun waiting for those condemned criminals to die. And the sponge, the hyssop that that 
soldier used was part of their field kit. It was meant to be used as a drinking vessel. So rather than being one last act of humiliation, this Roman soldier offers Jesus one final act of compassion. And this time Jesus accepts it. And he receives loving kindness from one who had only hours before been his worst enemy. It makes us believe that this is the same soldier who on Good Friday will utter the final word spoken at Jesus' crucifixion. Surely this man was God's son. This tender moment of compassion, one last visible sign of how life in the kingdom of God is meant to be lived. Can you see it? In the middle of such agonizing suffering, a beautiful moment of hope. As we say, a picture paints a thousand words. And this picture vividly portrays what Jesus had told his disciples in the last parable he gave them before making his final entrance into Jerusalem. A final picture for them to see the way of salvation. Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Imprisoned and you visited me. The kingdom of God, a present reality on earth as this soldier lifts up the sponge to give Jesus a drink. And Jesus' life poured out for the world, the power to redeem human hearts bent towards hate and humiliation into hearts capable of loving compassion. We are to see the way of salvation is to see, to respect, and to act from out of our shared humanity towards one another. Now more than ever, we need to take in this moment on the cross more fully. All throughout our human history, we've witnessed the terrifying ability to deny others their humanity, from slavery to genocide to hate crimes. As a nation, we're now struggling to acknowledge how deeply embedded this sin is in our history. To come to terms with people having to fight to be declared a human being. We all know our Constitution originally said that African Americans were three-fifths of a human being until the passage of the 13th Amendment. But you may never have heard of this person and this case of Standing Bear, who was a chief of the Ponca tribe in Nebraska. On a trip to the Grand Canyon, I picked up a book to read on the plane ride home. And being somewhat of a con law geek, I was more intrigued by the title because it was called, I Am a Man. And the story I've never forgotten to this day, because it reminded me at the time that we learn history, but we're not always aware of how much or how little it impacts us. So in 1864, the government forced Standing Bear and his tribe from their fertile land in Nebraska and moved them to what is now northern Oklahoma. 
So Standing Bear surrendered everything he owned, assembled his tribe, and began marching 600 miles, the Trail of Tears, as we now call it. His daughter died among many on the way, and his son died as soon as they arrived. And wanting to return his son's bones to the tribe's burial grounds so that he could walk the afterlife with his ancestors, according to their spirituality, Standing Bear decided to take his son home. And General George Crook was ordered to go after him and bring him back. And General Crook couldn't bear the thought. As he said, I've been forced many times by orders from Washington to do the most inhumane things in dealing with the Indians. But now I'm ordered to do a more cruel thing than ever before. But good soldier that he was, he would not disobey a direct order. So instead he stalled and he encouraged the editor of the, Oklahoma, the Omaha newspaper to enlist lawyers who would then sue General Crook on Standing Bear's behalf. And the essence of that suit was that the US government would recognize Standing Bear as a human being. And the most poignant part of the whole story is when Standing Bear stands up to testify on his own behalf. He's illiterate. He's uneducated. And this is what he says. I see a great, great many of you here. I think a great many are my friends. And then he explained his tribe's difficulties and stated that he never tried to hurt a white person, had even taken US soldiers into his home and nursed them back to health. And then in a stunning moment, he held out his hand and he said, this hand is not the color of yours. But if I pierce it, I shall feel pain. If you pierce your hand, you also feel pain. The blood that will flow from mine will be the same color as yours. I I'm a man. That was the first time a court ruled that a Native American was a human being rather than a savage, rather than something less than human. Ancient history, so we think. Yet we know it's a history that keeps repeating itself here in this land and all across the world. People are still fighting to have their humanity recognized, dignified, and protected. It is our fallen human nature to judge people who foreign in appearance, language, or manner, they do not simply become other they become lesser, a sin we witness all too often, that deeply embedded sin that, of dehumanization that leads to humiliation and oftentimes violence. It's a societal sin that plagues us, yet at times it's also our own in acts that may not rise to the level of a hate crime, but acts that are no less sinful and no less dehumanizing. We humiliate others by our attitudes, our behaviors, our choice of words, something as subtle as the click of our tongue or the roll of our eyes as we dismiss someone or mock someone for their beliefs their opinions, or their lifestyle. It 
And much more so than it is rooted in our heart, this sin is rooted in our mind and how we regard others. So that's the good news of the gospel. It's sin we can and are to overcome because we now have the mind of Jesus Christ within us. As Paul wrote, the love of Christ urges us on because we are convinced that one had died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all so that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. I don't think we like to dwell much on the ghastly wounds or the humiliation or the torture that Jesus endured. But I do think that is the invitation for us this morning. Because only as we see and acknowledge the brutality of our sin will we ever be able to see the real power of resurrection. Nor will we experience the real power of Christ's life living within us. like those disciples on Easter evening when Jesus showed him them his scars, then we will know that we too have the power to not regard others with our own minds, but with the mind of Christ. And then we are able to extend our loving compassion, as foreign as they may be. Amen.